The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. On today's episode, we're going to be building a pocket basic computer, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. It will be fun to build and have some cool real-world applications. Let's get started. The most important thing we're going to need to make a small pocket computer is a keyboard. Now we could try to like make our own little keyboard with individual buttons and laser cuts of switches, but it'd be a lot easier to use a small keyboard that already exists. And I decided about using a chat pad for an Xbox 360 controller. If you look at it, it only has a few connections. It actually has power, ground, transmit, and receive. So uh, we can use this, and luckily someone online has already written a driver for it. So um, before you reverse engineer anything, you should always look online to see if someone else has done it first because very likely they have. And sure enough, someone uh, reverse engineered or basically changed the firmware for the Xbox 360 chat pad. It has a PIC processor, which is a brand of uh, microcontroller unit, and it even has a programming header right here. So using this diagram and matching it up to the PIC Kit 3 programmer, which we can get from element14.com, you can use this to reprogram the chat pad so it'll send out standard serial data. So here's the PDF of the PIC Kit 3 that we got off Element 14. And you can see the pin out of the programmer here. Now it's very important to notice that even though it has the same number of pins as this, the pin out is not in the same order. There's some discrepancies. So we're gonna have to actually wire a header that uh, does the conversion for us. And one more thing we have to think about that's kind of important. Um, I've noticed there's trouble if you try to power this right here using the programmer. Uh, you can reset it and it won't work properly, so we're going to actually give this thing an external power source as we program it with this. So this goes into the programmer and obviously this is what goes into the pick. And I'm just making sure the pinout lines up so it'll program correctly. This is what I call applied superstition. If I leave my soldering iron on, it'll be right. If I turn my soldering iron off, it'll be wrong. So I'm going to leave it on so it'll be right. Okay, I'm going to use this Arduino as a 3.3 volt power source, basically, just to get power for now. Okay. Now let's try and program the pick. I zoomed in on the diagram so we can see exactly which pick it is. So over in this pick 3 programmer, which you can download off the microchip site, we're going to find that model pick so it knows what to look for then we should be able to read the contents of it and then flash it a new memory. Now that we have it connected to the chat pad, I'm going to read it to make sure we have a connection. Click read. Chat pad flashes, I guess, a couple of times. Okay, and we see the code, it's in hex. So that's good. So now we should be able to flash the new hex file onto it. So I went online and I found out that someone had written a driver so that this keyboard can output standard serial ASCII text, which is what we need. And uh, they've included a whole programming solution for the um, microchip uh, integrated development environment. But all we really need is the compiled file, which is the hex file. I mean, we could load of all these into the programmer and change it, but it's already been done. We just need that hex file right there. So we go to File, Import Hex. And of course, it goes to the wrong folder. OK, here's our hex file. All right, so this is what we want to put onto it. So now we hit right. Before we start programming, I'd like you to notice how there's one wire missing on this header here. That's the target power. It basically allows this to power that. However, I had some glitches with that before, so I'm not going to use it. But if you do want to use it, you can look right here in the programmer where it says target power. If you turn that on, it'll put this many volts on that pin. So in this case, if we were using it, we would want to put it down to 3.3, which is what that particular microcontroller uses. Now that we've reflashed the program on that pick, let's see if it works as a serial ASCII keyboard. We're gonna remove this AVR from the Arduino thing, which allows us to use this as a serial terminal, I hope. So this thing's going to send out its data into the Arduino's transmit, which should hopefully get it back into the computer. I guess we'll find out. Hello world. P 
period. Hello everyone, sorry for the interruption. We are getting ready for our third year of the Ben Heck Show, and we would love to get some feedback from you, the viewers, on what you think about the show. Please go to revision3.com forward slash Ben Heck survey and spend a few minutes to take this anonymous survey. Your feedback is very important to us. Thank you. And now back to your regularly scheduled episode. Next, we need to think about what we're going to use for a screen. And I think an LCD or a liquid crystal display would be great. It'd also be just like those old pocket computers from the 80s. Here's what I'm going to use, a Hitachi HD44780 display. The Hitachi 44780 thing is actually the interface, but pretty much any LCD you buy from Element 14 is going to have that same interface. Uh, it's basically, it has some control lines, power ground, and then uh, either eight or four bits of data. You can easily get by with four. Now that we've hooked up some jumpers to our LCD screen, we can hook it up to an AVR and test it. Plug in the four bits of data, the clock and other lines, then positive voltage, make sure the crystal's in place. I didn't use the internal one for some reason. All right, let's see if that works. Ah, there you go. Contrast needs some adjusting, but uh, it works. So yeah, if we were to, um, if we didn't have this pull down here, <clears throat> you would get nothing. It doesn't work because what that does is it, if you're not using all the lines, that line there in particular is the read write line. And in order for it to be written to, which is all we're doing, it needs to be active low. So that needs to be connected. If reconnected though, it should probably work. The amount of resistance you should put between ground and the contrast line should be between zero and 10K ohms. So what I did here was I added a 5K ohm resistor in series with a 5K potentiometer which gives us a nice contrast adjustment right there. This is not a backlit LCD, but when they are backlit, usually you can get the power for that from this anode and cathode point right here. All right, so that should be ready to go. Do you ever find yourself spending hours and hours searching for technologies for a new design? If you're like me, you'd rather spend that time building. Then the node on Element 14 is for you. It was built for design engineers who want a quick and easy way to find the best products and solutions to complete their embedded system design projects. And since it's part of the Element 14 community, the Node also makes it easy to access manufacturer and industry experts, technical videos, webinars, documents, and other engineers. The Node has been redesigned and is now easier than ever. You can find development kit information you need to help you get your design from concept to prototype, all organized and easy to access. There's a single search bar to search all technical content quickly across all phases of the design flow. You can save and store your research by adding parts, documents, and data to the My Lists tool. You can put your schematic together and lay it all out with a complete library of training, white paper, and design assistance to develop your schematics with CADsoft's Eagle. With fast access to over 1,000 dev kits, 300 dev tools, thousands of free CAD libraries, and local PCB fabrication and prototyping services, every engineer should have the node in their arsenal. No matter where you are in your design process, visit element14.com forward slash node to help make your next design much easier. The Node is just another way that Element 14 makes it easy for engineers to be inspired and find the solutions they need to get the job done. And now, back to the show. Now let's put Tiny Basic onto the AVR microcontroller. Tiny Basic is a version of Basic that fits in a tiny amount of space. Uh, I went online and found out that someone had ported uh, Tiny Basic to the AVR. Specifically, they made an Arduino version of it. So that's the version I'm going to use. We'll get it running on this and then we'll modify it so we can use the keyboard and that screen, the LCD screen. Okay, so here is the Tiny Basic. I've got it open in Notepad++ because it's a much better editor to use than what they give you for the Arduino. Uh, this is the basic version. It's going to use the serial terminal on the computer for its communication. So it's going to run on a little microcontroller, but its input and output is going to use the serial communication. So we can use the serial terminal to access it. I will flash it to the chip and then we will try it out. All right, now we're going to use this program called the Termite, which is just a simple terminal program to talk to it. All right, tiny basic, not much memory free. There's only 2K on the uh, AVR AT Mega 328P, but whatever. All right, if we look at the code here, it looks like everything that goes to the screen or the, or the terminal goes to something called out character. If 
if we're defined to be an Arduino, we do serial write, which means it's just writing it to the serial port. So this is what we have to change right here. So we're going to make it so we can go to the LCD. So we need to put some code in for that. Okay, first we'll get rid of this. We still need to keep the C because that's the, that's the value that's been passed into this object. We'll make a new object called LCD character C. We'll go down here and we will create it. Static void LCD character. Use byte C, same thing. Now what we're gonna do here is make it so the, it'll bring the letter C in now, but instead of that coming from your serial terminal, it's gonna be coming from the little keyboard. So we're gonna have to identify some of the special things in this keyboard, such as the control button is now a green square, and there's also another one over here. So we have to make sure that if pushing this and this is some sort of key sequence, that we lob off the, the right characters that we need to make it work. And also we need to make sure enter gives us the right value. Okay, so now when BASIC tries to output a character, it goes into our LCD character routine. And it can do one of three things. It's either going to be a backspace, which is indicated by the character being the ASCII 8, in which case it just goes backwards, erases memory. So when you hit backspace, it actually will erase the last thing you did. Therefore, there won't be a syntax error. The other thing it can do is it can just have a normal character. So basically, if it's not a backspace or a carriage return, which is usually 13 and then a 10, in uh, ASCII, it will just put the character on the screen. However, if the character scrolls past the edge of the screen, which is you know 16 uh, characters wide, it will cause a line feed, which will cause it to scroll, which is the same thing as pushing return. So the third thing that it does is if it does see you going past the end of screen memory or hitting return, it actually has screen memory for everything, so it shifts it all up, so it scrolls up, and then puts the cursor in the new position. And then we have a routine called do frame, and what DoFrame does is it actually, it's not just putting each character on the LCD one at a time. Once there's a new frame of data, it actually puts, it redraws the entire display every time. So basically we have some memory assigned in the microcontroller to the access screen memory. Not a whole lot, but some. So that actually reduces the size of our program by about like 80 bytes. So yeah, with these three things in place, we should be able to put in the LCD library and then send data to the LCD instead of computer monitor. Give this power, hook up the LCD, and see if it works. Yeah, now we just gotta hook up the keyboard. All right, so the keyboard has three lines. It has um, power. Uh, remember, the keyboard is a 3.3 volt device, so we have to plug it into that, but luckily this has it. Then it's gonna need a ground reference, of course. And then, of course, the data. So we wanna be receiving the data here. All right, let's reset it. Hey, look at that. Hello world. All right, we have the tiny basic working. So now we're gonna make a cool custom enclosure for it, wire it up with an embedded processor. And then finally, write some routines that'll let it do some other things such as uh, run lights and uh, do some PWM and also possibly servo control. And then I can show you kind of the reason for building this basic computer. There really is a reason besides just nostalgia and coolness. Let's say you've got your ghost here on this Ghost Squad game. Now, let's say we want to put the arm on him. Now, the default position of the arm will be at the center of the servo, which is 90 degrees. But we really don't know what that is. But using a little box, we can manually set the servo in the place we want it, and then attach the arm centered so that we know it will be right when we play the game. So this is useful because I can actually send commands to the servos and troubleshoot them without the computer hooked up. So I'm gonna put this arm back in its rest position, which is spot 90. Now I'm gonna hook up the servo that has no arm on it. Now I'm gonna tell that servo to go to position 90. Now that I know the arm is in the right position. All right, let me show you a program I just put in. Okay. I also made it so you can just list one line at a time, like line 10 or you can list the entire program just by typing list. All right, so this program should make the arms go up, down, up, down. So we can actually hook up both servos. Hopefully it works.
There you have it. I built a small little computer with an LCD screen and a chat pad keyboard from an Xbox 360. And not only can you use it to relive the memories of the 80s and those early days of programming, but you can also control external devices using this bus here. So yeah, this would be a handy thing to have around a shop or a handy thing for uh, people on element14.com to register and win. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be taking on a viewer challenge to make an automatic houseplant rotator that will help your plants grow evenly on all sides. We'll see you then.